As I drive to the west side of the Nile River near Luxor, Egypt, among cotton fields once belonging to the ancient town of Thebes, I'm on my way to see some of the most famous, yet largely forgotten, statues in history. The Colossi of Memnon may not beat the tourist appeal of the mortuary temple of Hatshepsut, but these statues used to gather ancient tourists from around the world near the Valley of the Kings due to their alleged ability to sing haunting songs. They were said to have been possessed by ghosts, and their construction method is largely unconquered by the ages. You won't want to go anywhere. This is a really unbelievably interesting site that has a lot more to it than meets the eye. Don't go anywhere. You're going to want to watch this video. Hey everybody, Josh Searts in a World Alternative Media here, and I am at the amazing Colossi of Memnon, which is on the west bank of the Nile by Luxor. Um, this is a, an amazing site, somewhere that I've always wanted to go. I've been dying to go here for years, ever since I first heard of it, because these statues are a lot bigger than they look. Um, you will see one of them is almost in pieces. That statue right there was renovated um, in Roman times and then this one right here is one giant rock it's all one piece the Colossi are all that stand from the once massive temple of Amenhotep III a temple that once rivaled even nearby Karnak the statues which get inundated by water yearly are considered a symbol of regrowth the name Memnon comes from the Trojan War after Ethiopia's King Memnon. Greek tourists initially believed the statues were of the king rather than Amenhotep III, and the name stuck. Legend said that Memnon's mother Eos could be heard singing through the statues. Now these statues used to be a lot closer to the Nile, as you could probably see. The Nile is not there right now, but at times, these were partially submerged in water. Now, I'm not going to make any claims about these being pre-dynastic, though we have seen a lot of um, statues that were clearly pre-dynastic with scientific geological evidence like the Sphinx that was, you know, later renovated. And, you know, the ancient Egyptians said they renovated it and they found it in the desert and built around it. Um, that, of course, is notable because the head is much smaller than the rest of the body, which has water erosion on it, like the enclosure. With these, now we know there's renovation on it. We know the Romans uh, renovated it, and we know the translations of the Roman language of, of the ancient Romans much better because we know that it says they renovated it, whereas there's some confusion about the Sphinx, whether it was renovated or built. That was what uh, a lot of people have been caught up on. I think it's clear that it's been renovated. For this, With this example, we have this statue on one side that is one giant stone that was, um, this is the most amazing part, actually quarried 420 miles away. And it's supposed to represent Amenhotep III back in the 14th century BC. That's what they allege anyway. Again, I don't know, but those are some massive statues. And there is some very interesting burn marks on them that look almost like they were blasted by some insane amount of heat. We'll look at that, but make of that what you will. Yeah, see, you can see some very clear erosion over here 
on this side of it. You can see some darkness. That could be pollution on that one. I can't tell, but it almost looks like the rock was melted here. And you can very clearly see the renovation up there. I mean, it stands out. And again, the ancients, pre-Roman, were able to build things much better than the Romans were. The Romans were very good at building themselves. And that begs the question, why is it that the most amazingly built um, structures and statues in the world were the earliest and then they just lost that over time and slowly got worse. I think there is substantial evidence of a lost ancient civilization that once um, lived here and people just don't want to get around that puzzle in the in most cases because it would have to they would have to change the history books and no one wants to do that people are very stubborn unfortunately in the scientific profession in all realms and refuse to update textbooks unless you know the establishment says they can but the establishment has stood behind these beliefs about the ancient egyptians going back to about the 1820s and have barely budged since the 1820s which really brings a lot of things to question. They also said Troy never existed, and then they found Troy, and now they're putting it back possibly to 5,000 BC or earlier. And they also have said that Atlantis doesn't exist uh, or never existed. Well, maybe it wasn't called Atlantis, but the Egyptians themselves say at Edfu, where I'm going tomorrow, in their temple, that it was um, this city called the homeland of the primeval ones, a circular structure of islands that um, fell into the sea but populated Egypt and passed on knowledge of their technology to um, Thoth, the god of wisdom, um, via the seven sages at Edfu. So, again, make of that what you will. I believe a lot of people would be quite surprised if they actually knew the true extent of where people get their evidence from regarding um, the mainstream ideas of ancient Egypt. They literally guessed things 200 years ago and have stuck to them ever since and refused to change them. So that's the academic community in a nutshell, isn't it? Anyways, it's a very fascinating site that doesn't get quite as much attention as it should anymore, especially these days with the lack of tourism, but I honestly think it's one of the coolest places in in the country. I've been very much drawn to uh, these structures, these statues, for many, many years, and some of the old paintings done of the Colossi are absolutely beautiful, and I highly recommend people look at it. It's Facing south southeast, but at one point in time, this is the coolest part, Zep Tepe, the first time as the Egyptians called it, it was facing, you guessed it, due east, due east. And um, of course, like most structures in Egypt, it's aligned almost perfectly with constellations and the uh, winter and summer solstice, especially in about 10,400. BC again, Septepe the first time, which also seems to correlate with Noah's Ark and the fall of Atlantis and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, it's always good to keep that in mind when looking at these places because they have a history that always strangely reflects that same first time story that also encapsulates things like Gobekli Tepe, which we went and researched on the ground last year alongside the documentary I did on Karahan Tepe, which I recommend people watch, though it was purged from YouTube. Um, I think someone posted it on YouTube again, reposted it after it cut like uh, 100,000 views originally. Unbelievable site that everyone needs to check out in Turkey as well. But anyway, 
I appreciate everyone watching here today. This was a really cool experience for myself and I hope you enjoyed it yourself. I can't tell what the brightness looks like because uh, I'm kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place with the lighting here, but nonetheless, um, it's better to be stuck between a rock and a hard place than be the rock, like these guys. Um, anyway, uh, I appreciate everyone watching. Make sure to check the links below, hit the like button, and uh, join us on BitChute, library slash odyssey, as well as float.app. Until next time, this is Josh Sirton signing out from World Alternative Media. Find the truth, be the change. I'm sure you have already changed people's minds in your young age because you're involved and I like that. <laughs>